Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf YouTube channel. Today, we will resume our reading of The Sorrowless Flower, authored by Ngoc Tran, known as Dharma Name Thien Phuc, and this is episode number 27. 359. The Thus Come One. Devout Buddhists should always remember that Tathagata is neither a god nor the prophet of a god. In Mahayana Buddhism, Tathagata is the Buddha in his Nirmanakaya, the intermediary between the essential and the phenomenal world. Tathagata also means absolute prajna or emptiness shunyata. The Tathagata who has gone beyond all plurality and categories of thought can be said to be neither permanent nor impermanent. He is untraceable. Permanent and impermanent can be applied only where there is duality, not in the case of non-dual. And because Tathata is the same in all manifestation, therefore all beings are potential Tathagatas. It is the Tathagata within us who makes us long for Nibbana and ultimately sets us free. Tathagata is one of the ten titles of the Buddha, which he himself used when speaking of himself or other Buddhas. He was born, lived and passed away. He left no room in his teaching for any other superstition. This event of the life of the Tathagata is human beings' greatest impression and hope, for every one of us can hope that someday we can reach the same stage as the Tathagata did, if we resolve to do our best to cultivate. Long before our Buddha was born, there were many other Buddhas who found the path and showed it to people. These other Buddhas lived so long ago that we have no written histories about them, but they taught the people in those far-off days the very same truth that our Sakyamuni Buddha taught us almost 2600 years ago, for the truths never change. Tathagata literally means one thus come the thus or thusness indicating the enlightened state. Therefore, Tathagata can be rendered as thus enlightened I come, and would apply equally to all Buddhas other than Sakyamuni. The thus come one also means one who has attained supreme enlightenment, one who has discovered, come to, truth, one of the ten titles of the Buddha, which he himself used when speaking of himself or other Buddhas, those of the Tathagata order. Tathagata is a Sanskrit term for thus gone one. An epithet of Buddhas, which signifies their attainment of awakening, bodhi, a transcendental state that surpasses all mundane attainments. This term may be divided into either of the following formulas. Tatha plus gata, or Tatha plus agata. In the former case, it means no ku and in the latter case no lie. A title of the Buddha, used by his followers and also by himself when speaking of himself. Tathagata also means the previous Buddhas have come and gone. According to the middle-length collections, Majjhimanakaya, Tathagata is a perfect being whose footprints or tracks are untraceable who is above all the dichotomies of thought. According to the Dhammapada 254, the word Tathagata means thus gone or so gone meaning trackless or whose track cannot be traced by any of the categories of thought. According to Nagarjuna in the Madhyamaka philosophy, regardless the origin of the word Tathagata the function of it is clear. He descends on earth to impart the light of truth to mankind and departs without any track. He is the embodiment of Tathata. When the Buddha is called Tathagata, his individual personality is ignored, he is treated as a type that appears from time to time in the world. He is the earthly manifestation of Dharma. Tathagata includes the Tathagata in bonds and Tathagata unlimited and free from bonds. The Tathagata in bonds, limited and subject to the delusions and sufferings of life, or the fettered Bhutadathata, the Bhutadathata in limitations, Tathagata unlimited and free from bonds, not subject to the delusions and sufferings of life anymore, or the unfettered or free Bhutadathata, as contrast with fettered Bhutadathata, Taitri and Chan no. Sunyata and Karuna are the essential characteristics of Tathagata. Sunyata here means prajna or transcendental insight. Having Sunyata or prajna, Tathagata is identical with Tathata or Sunya. Having Karuna, he is the savior of all sentient beings. Tathagata means the true being of all. The true being of the Tathagata which is also the true being of all is not conceivable. In his ultimate nature, the Tathagata is deep, immeasurable, unfathomable. The dharmas or elements of existence are indeterminable because they are conditioned, because they are relative. The Tathagata is indeterminable because, in his ultimate nature, he is not conditionally born. 
the indeterminability of the ultimate nature really means the inapplicability of the ways of concepts. Thus, Nagarjuna in the Karaka. The Buddha is transcendental in regard to thoughts and words. He is not subject to birth and death. Those who describe the Buddha in the terms of conceptual categories are all victims of the worldly and verbalizing mind and are thus unable to see the Tathagata in his real nature. 360. Tathagata Garbha. The absolute, the true nature of all things which is immutable, immovable and beyond all concepts and distinctions. A Sanskrit term for the innate potential for Buddhahood or Buddha nature that is present in all sentient beings. Tathagatagarbha is the womb where the Tathagata is conceived and nourished and matured. Tathagatagarbha also means the Alayavajnana which fully purified of its habit energy, vasana, and evil tendencies, dishdulya. According to the Mahayana Buddhism, everything has its own Buddha nature in the Dharmakaya. Tathagatagarbha is the cause of goods as well as evils which creates the various paths of existence. In some texts, Mahayana texts, for example, Tathagata Garbha is equated with emptiness, sunyata, and is based on the notion that since all beings, all phenomena lack inherent existence, svabhava, and are constantly changing in dependence upon causes and conditions, there is no fixed essence. Thus Buddha nature is not something that is developed through practices of meditation or as a result of meditation, but rather is one's most basic nature which is simply made manifest through removing the veils of ignorance that obscure it. However, meditation plays a crucial role in our cultivation life, for it's a main tool that helps us to remove the beginningless veils of ignorance, so that Buddha nature can manifest. Matrix of thus come or thus gone or Tathagata Garbha has a twofold meaning. Thus come or thus gone or Buddha concealed in the womb, man's nature, and the Buddha nature as it is. Tathagata Garbha is the absolute unitary storehouse of the universe, the primal source of all things. Therefore, the Tathagata is in the midst of the delusion of passions and desires, and the Tathagata is the source of all things. All created things are in the Tathagata Garbha, which is the womb that gives birth to them all, whether compatible or incompatible, whether forces of purity or impurity, good or bad. The realm of the Tathagatagarbha which is another name for the Alayavajnana, is beyond the views based on the imagination of the Sravakas and Pratyekabuddhas and philosophers. Tathagatagarbha is the womb where the Tathagata is conceived and nourished and matured. Tathagatagarbha also means the Alayavajnana which fully purified of its habit energy, vasana, and evil tendencies, dishdulya. Tathagatagarbha also means Buddha nature. According to the Mahayana Buddhism, everything has its own Buddha nature in the Dharmakaya. Tathagatagarbha is the cause of goods as well as evils which creates the various paths of existence. 361. Neither birth nor death. This phrase means not changing and going away or coming forth, there is neither origination nor cessation. The phrase going away expresses the idea of things disappearing, while the phrase coming forth indicates the things appearing. The whole phrase neither birth nor death means all things seem to be changing, but they appear to be doing so from a phenomenal and relative point of view. It is an accepted doctrine of the Prajna teaching and the ultimate doctrine of the Madhyamaka school. Birth, creation, life, each is but a temporary term, in common statement it is called birth, in truth it is not birth, in the relative it is birth, in the absolute non-birth. When the Tathagata sees the real state of all things, they neither disappear, and they are immortal and eternal. When this idea applied to the human body, coming forth means birth and going away means death. Although man seems to be born, grow old, suffer from disease, and finally die, these phenomena are only produced by superficial changes in the substances that form the human body, true human life continues eternally. This confirms the law of indestructibility of matter, through which science confirms that matter neither decreases nor disappears. The snow on the ground seems to melt away as the days go by, but in reality, it merely changes into water and sinks into the ground or evaporates into the air. The snow only changes its form, the quantity of fundamental elements that constitute it do not decrease, much less disappear. When water vapor in the air comes into contact with cold air as a condition or secondary cause, 
it becomes a tiny drop of water. These drops accumulate to form a cloud. When these tiny drops of water join to form large drops of water, they become rain and fall on the earth. They will fall not as rain, but as snow when the temperature falls below a certain point. Thus though matter seems to disappear, in actual fact it does not disappear, but only changes in form. The same can be said of man. In the sight of the Tathagata the birth and death of man are merely changes in form. Man's life itself remains eternally. Seen with the eye of the Buddha, man's existence is neither living nor dead. 362. 3000 Great, Thousand World. It is as a billion world universe is not formed just by one condition, not by one phenomenon, it can be formed only by innumerable conditions, innumerable things. That is to say the rising and spreading of great clouds and showering of great rain produce four kinds of atmosphere, continuously making a basis. All are produced by the joint actions of sentient beings and by the roots of goodness of enlightened beings, enabling all sentient beings to get the use of what they need. Innumerable such causes and conditions form the universe. It is such by the nature of things, there is no producer or maker, no knower or creator, yet the worlds come to be. Over 25 centuries ago, the Buddha talked about the immensity and endlessness of the cosmos. The earth on which we are living is not unique. There are a great number of others, which are as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges River. 3000 Great Thousand World Universe of the three kinds of thousands of worlds, the threefold great thousand world system Buddha world. Each big celestial world comprises 1,000 million small worlds, each one has the same size as that of our Earth. Furthermore, there are an infinite number of big celestial worlds in the cosmos. The Buddhist concept of time reveals that each world has four middle kalpas or cosmic periods, each middle kalpa has 20 small kalpas, each small kalpa has 16 million years. Therefore, the average life of a world is equal to 1,280,000,000 years. The ancient Indian belief the universe comprises of many groups of thousands of worlds. Also called a small chiliochism. A small chiliochism, consisting of a thousand worlds each with its Mount Zumeru, continents, seas and ring of iron mountains. However, according to Buddhist teachings, every world system has four great continents, a thousand world systems of four great continents comprise a small world system, a thousand small world systems comprise a medium-sized world system, and a thousand medium-sized world systems comprise a great world system of a billion worlds, literally thousand times thousand times thousand worlds. The Tiantai school sets forth a world system of ten realms. That is to say, the world of living beings is divided into ten realms, of which the higher four are saintly, and the lower six are ordinary. Here the Tiantai school at once comes back to the ideation theory, but expresses it somewhat differently. It is set forth that a conscious instant or a moment of thought has three thousand worlds imminent in it. This is a theory special to this school and is called 3000 originally imminent or 3000 imminent in principle or 3000 imminent in nature or sometimes 3000 perfectly imminent. The imminency, either original, theoretical, natural or perfect, conveys one and the same idea, namely, that the one moment of thought is itself 3000 worlds. Some consider this to be the nearest approach to the idea of the Absolute, but if you consider the Absolute to be the source of all creation, it is not exactly the Absolute. Or, it may be considered to be a form of ideation theory, but if one thinks that ideation manifests the outer world by the process of dichotomy it is quite different, for it does not mean that one instant of thought produces the 3000 worlds, because a production is the beginning of a lengthwise motion, i.e., timely production. Nor does it mean that the 3000 worlds are included in one instant of thought, because an inclusion is a crosswise existence, i.e., existence in space. Although here the 3000 world doctrine is expounded on the basis of ideation, it is not mere ideation, for all the dharmas of the universe are imminent in one thought instant, but are not reduced to thought or ideation. 363. Form is emptiness, and the very emptiness is form. 
The Pali scripture declares six sense organs, six sense objects and six consciousnesses, as well as five aggregates are sunyata as I is void of self, and anything belonging to self, form is void from self and anything belonging to self, visual consciousness is void of self, and anything belonging to self. Matter is just the immaterial, the immaterial is just matter, form. Is emptiness and the very emptiness is form rupamiva sunyata, sunyateva rupam. In the Heart Sutra, the Buddha told Sariputra. Sariputra. This phenomenal world or form is emptiness, and emptiness is truly the phenomenal world. Emptiness is not different from the phenomenal world, the phenomenal world is not different from emptiness. What is the phenomenal world that is emptiness, what is emptiness that is the phenomenal world? The Rudaya Sutra expands this concept by emphasis that Rupa does not differ from Sunya, or Sunya does not differ from Rupa and Sunya of all things is not created, not annihilated, not impure, not pure, not increasing, and not decreasing. It means that because Rupa must have no nature of its own, it is produced by causes or depend on anything else, so Rupa is sunyata or identical with void. Therefore, the perceived object, the perceiving subject and knowledge are mutually interdependent. The reality of one is dependent upon others, if one is false, the others must be false. The perceiving subject and knowledge of the external object must also be false. So what one perceives within or without is illusory. Therefore, there is nothing, creation and annihilation, pure and impure, increase and decrease and so on. However, in reality, we cannot say a thing to be either real or unreal at the same time. Here, sunyata must be defined as pratityasamitpada. There is the intimate connection that exists between causality and sunyata. The one presupposes the other, the two are inseparably connected. Sunyata is the logical consequence of the Buddha's view of causality and affection. Sunyata is the central theme of the Mahayana philosophical system. This term has been used in the Prajnaparamita system to denote a stage where all viewpoints with regard to the real nature of mundane world are totally rejected. In other words, we may say that to have a viewpoint is to cling to a position, and there can be various types of positions with regard to the real nature of things as Siddharma Pandaria expressed. Knowing that phenomena have no constant fixed nature, that the seeds of Buddhahood sprout through causation. 364. Forms in Trilaksana. According to the Anatalakana Sutta, the Buddha taught. O, oh, Bhiksas, is the form not the self. If the form, O oh, Bhiksas, were the self, the body would not be subject to disease, and we should be able to say let my body be such and such a one, let my body not be such and such a one. But since this body, O oh, Bhiksas, is not the self, therefore, the body is subject to disease, and we are not able to say let my body be such and such a one, let my body not be such and such a one. The Buddha further said. Now what do you think, O oh, Bhiksas, is the body permanent or perishable? It is perishable, Lord. The Buddha added. And that which is perishable, does that cause pain or joy? It causes pain, Lord. And that which is perishable, painful, subject to change, is it possible to regard that in this way? This is mine, this am I, this is myself? That is impossible, Lord. By the method of analysis the Buddha pointed out to his disciples that attachment to things without a correct view as to their true nature is the cause of suffering. Impermanence and change are inherent in the nature of all things. This is their true nature and this is the correct view, and as long as we are at variance with it, we are bound to run into conflicts. We cannot alter or control the nature of things, and the result is disappointment or suffering. The only solution to this problem lies in correcting our own point of view. 365. Mandala. Mandalas are both symbolic representations of the Buddhist world, and meditational aids testimony to the fact there is no clear divide in Buddhism between cosmology and psychology. As cosmograms they are maps of the universe, while as meditational aids they are psychological tools, which assist the meditator to experience different states of mind. By concentrating on a mandala, circle in Sanskrit, the individual can progress toward an understanding of the reality of the world as perceived by Buddhism. 
mandalas, which take various forms, are often two- and three-dimensional. They range from temporary images in sand to paintings and vast stone structures. Simple color discs can also serve as meditational aids. In the 9th century, Buddhist monument of Barabudur in Indonesia took the form of a mandala. Its many terraces contain stone reliefs depicting the Buddha's life story. In esoteric Buddhism, mandala means a ritual or magic circle, or a diagram used in invocations, meditation and temple services. Mandala is a ritual or magic circle, a plot or place of enlightenment, a round or square altar on which Buddhas or Bodhisattvas are placed. There are two groups of such, especially the Garbhadhadu and Vajradhadu groups of the Shingon sect. The Garbhadhadu representing the principle and cause, and the Vajradhadu representing the intelligence and the effect. A circular figure or diagram used in invocations, meditation and temple services in Tantric Buddhism. A symbolic representation of cosmic forces in two- or three-dimensional form, which is considerably significant in the Tantric Buddhism in Tibet and means center and periphery. In Tantric Buddhism or the Vajrayana, the external world as well as the body and one's own consciousness can be seen as mandalas. Mandalas are particularly important in Vajrayana, where they serve as the focus of meditative visualizations. Tantric practitioners usually initiate a mandala before engaging in a particular practice or ceremony. The basic form or structure of a mandala is circle outside a square palace with four gates in the four cardinal directions, north, south, west, east. Mandalas can be represented in four ways as follows. Painted pictures, drawn with colored sands, represented by heaps of rice, constructed three-dimensionally. 366. Esoteric teachings. Exoteric or public teaching to the visible audience. The exoteric teachings or schools, Vajradhadu and Garbhadhadu of Virakana, belong to esoteric teaching. The open sects, in contrast with the esoteric. While esoteric teaching to an audience invisible to the other assembly. Secret the teaching was not revealed to those unworthy or unfit to receive it. The esoteric method. The esoteric mantra, or Yogacara sect, developed especially in Shingon, with Virakana as the chief object of worship, and the mandalas of Garbhadhadu and Vajradhadu. The esoteric teaching or tantric Buddhism, in contrast with the open schools, he and yo. The Buddhist tantra consists of sutras of a so-called mystical nature which endeavor to teach the inner relationship of the external world and the world of spirit, of the identity of mind and universe. Among the devices employed in tantric meditational practices are the following. A. A composite picture graphically portraying different classes of demons, deities, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, representing various powers, forces, and activities, within symbolic squas and circles, B. In the center of which is a figure of the Buddha Virakana, the Great Illuminator. And a diagrammatic representation wherein certain sacred Sanskrit letters, called Bijar seeds are substituted for figures, in the secret teachings, these sacred sounds, such as Om, for example, are transmitted from the master to his disciple at the time of initiation. When the disciple's mind is properly attuned, the inner vibrations of this word symbol together with its associations in the consciousness of the initiate are said to open his mind to higher dimension. Besides, different types of mudra are used in cultivating. These are physical gestures, especially symbolical hand movements, which are performed to help evoke certain states of mind parallel to those of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Esoteric teachings is one of the eight types of teaching. Esoteric teaching, only understood by special members of the assembly. Also the esoteric sect, one of the four modes of teachings defined by T and Thai sect. The secret teaching, in fact, it is a mystical indeterminate doctrine. It is indeterminate and varied because many a listener is concealed from another by the Buddha's supernatural power, and each thinks that the Buddha is teaching him alone. Thus all hear separately and variously. Such indeterminacy exists from the time of the wreath to the time of wisdom. The secret method, which was used by the Buddha only when addressing to one person, in which case the Buddha was understood by this only person, Opposite to the common doctrine, 
this dharma is passed on at a hidden level and has the characteristics of the deepest and most profound meanings of Buddhism. This doctrine teaches cultivators to recite mantras, make Buddha seals with hands, etc. If the three karmas of the cultivators become one with the Buddha, then the cultivators will attain Buddhahood. Meaning if the cultivator's mind, speech and body is similar to that of the Buddha, then Buddhahood is attained. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of esoteric speech of the Buddhas. Enlightening beings who abide by these can master the unexcelled skillful esoteric speech of the Buddhas. First, the skillful esoteric sayings and all the discourses of Buddhas. Second, skillful esoteric sayings about all places of birth. Third, skillful esoteric sayings about all enlightening beings' spiritual manifestations and attainment of enlightenment. Fourth, skillful esoteric sayings about the consequences of actions of all sentient beings. Fifth, skillful esoteric sayings about the defilement and purity produced by all sentient beings. Sixth, skillful esoteric sayings about how to be ultimately unobstructed in the midst of all things. Seventh, skillful esoteric sayings about how in every place and space are worlds, some becoming, some decaying, without any gaps in between. Eighth, skillful esoteric sayings about how everywhere in all places in all universes, in all phenomena, even in microscopic points, there are Buddhas manifesting birth, attainment of Buddhahood, and entry into final nirvana, filling the cosmos, each distinctly seen. Ninth, skillful esoteric sayings about seeing all sentient beings as equally nirvanic, being unchanged, yet not giving up great aspirations, causing them to be fulfilled by the vow for omniscience. Tenth, skillful esoteric sayings about not abandoning teachers in spite of knowing that truths are not realized through the agency of another, honoring the enlightened even more, becoming one with spiritual friends in cultivating, dedicating, and living by virtues, with the same actions, the same essence, the same emancipation, the same fulfillment. Practitioners of secret teachings believe that Yudhams is their tutelary deities or Buddhas who are the focus of tantric visualization practices. They often represent ideal qualities such as compassion or wisdom, but are also considered to be real entities, which exist as enjoyment bodies residing in the Buddhist heavens. In deity yoga practice, meditators create a vivid image of a particular yi dam and imagine that it possesses all the ideal qualities of a buddha this is called the generation stage it is followed by the completion stage in which one imagines that the buddha merges with oneself and that one becomes indistinguishable from the yi dam the visualized image is referred to as the pledge being and the actual entity that is being summoned in the visualization practice is called the wisdom being this practice requires that one obtain the requisite initiation from a qualified guru, and the actual visualization is guided by his or her oral instructions. 367. Nirvana. Total extinction of desires and sufferings. Nirvana is the supreme goal of Buddhist endeavor. When we speak about nirvana we encounter some problems of expression, because the exact nature of an experience cannot and never can be communicated merely by words. This experience must be experienced directly by each one of us, without any exception. We have to experience the end of sufferings and afflictions for ourselves, and the only way we can do this is by eliminating the causes of sufferings and afflictions. The attachment, aversion, and ignorance. When we have eliminated such causes of sufferings and afflictions, then we will experience nirvana for ourselves. Nirvana is a Sanskrit term for cessation. The term is a combination of the Sanskrit prefix nir plus the verbal root va and literally means blow out or extinguish. This is a cessation of the process of becoming, eternal peace, or extinction or ultimate reality absolute truth, or the state achieved by the conquest of craving, the extinction of birth and death. This is the highest state of bliss, peace and purity. This is the unconditioned reality. This is also the supreme goal of Buddhist endeavor, the spiritual goal of Buddhism, release from the limitations of existence. A state which is free from rebirth by extinguishing of all desires and the elimination of egoism. According to the Lankavatara Sutra, 
nirvana means to see the abode of reality as it is, and after seeing this abodhisattva with great compassion, forego his own nirvana, in order to lead others to liberation. Nirvana consists of nir meaning exit, and vana meaning craving. Nirvana means the extinguishing or liberating from existence by ending all suffering. So nirvana is the total extinction of desires and sufferings, or release, joy thought. It is the final stage of those who have put an end to suffering by the removal of craving from their mind. In Mahayana Buddhism, nirvana has the fluing meanings. Inaction or without effort, diet, no rebirth, voasan, calm joy, and laic, an extinction or extinguish or tranquil extinction or transmigration to extinction, touch diet. In other word, nirvana means extinction of ignorance and craving and awakening to inner peace and freedom. Nirvana with a small n stands against samsara or birth and death. Nirvana also refers to the state of liberation through full enlightenment. Nirvana is also used in the sense of a return to the original purity of the Buddha nature, after the dissolution of the physical body, that is to the perfect freedom of the unconditioned state. The supreme goal of Buddhist endeavor. An attainable state in this life by right aspiration, purity of life, and the elimination of egoism. The Buddha speaks of nirvana as unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, and unformed contrasting with the born, originated, created and formed phenomenal world. The ultimate state is the nirvana of no abode, a pratisdita nirvana, that is to say, the attainment of perfect freedom, not being bound to one place. Nirvana is used in both Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhist schools. In the Lankavatara Sutra, the Buddha told Mahamati. O Mahamati, nirvana means seeing into the abode of reality and its true significance. The abode of reality is where a thing stands by itself. To abide in one's self station means not to be astir, i.e., to be eternally quiescent. By seeing into the abode of reality as it is means to understand that there is only what is seen of one's own mind, and no external world as such. After the Buddha's departure, most of the metaphysical discussions and speculations centered around the subject of nirvana. The Mahaparinirvana Sutra, the Sanskrit fragments of which were discovered recently, one in Central Asia and another in Khoisan, indicates a vivid discussion on the questions as to what is Buddha nature thusness the realm of principal dharma body, and the distinction between the Hinayana and Mahayana ideas. All of these topics relate to the problem of nirvana, and indicate the great amount of speculation undertaken on this most important question. The most probable explanation of nirvana is that it is the highest level of meditation, the ceasing of ideation and feeling. The attainment of nirvana is also called the cessation of consciousness, since rebirth is effected through the medium of vijnana, and the nirvana is the cessation of rebirth, the reality of no self. In the stream of consciousness processes, of which vijnana consists, is stopped and emptied, usually by means of the meditational exercises to insight exist. Buddhism had always maintained that the state of nirvana cannot be expressed in words by a lot of negation such as, there is the not born, the not become, the not created, the not compounded. There is the realm where there is neither earth nor water, neither the boundless realm of space nor boundless consciousness. There is neither coming nor going nor standing, neither origination nor annihilation, this is the end of suffering. So, nirvana is beyond all suffering and change. It is as unfading, still, undecaying, taintless, as peace and blissful. It is an island, the shelter, the refuge and the goal. In addition, the term nibbana in the literature of Pali Nikayas clearly refers to a unity eternally existing beyond the three world. It is infinite, inexpressible, unborn, undecaying and empty. It is homogeneous and knows no individuality. In it, all discriminations or dichotomy cease. The Buddha said that nirvana is supreme happiness, peace, immortal, uncreated, beyond earth, water, fire, and air, the sun and moon. It is unfathomable and immeasurable. He has described nirvana in the following terms. Infinite, an antipi, non-conditioned, asamkata, p, incomparable, anupamaya p, supreme, anatara p, highest, para p, beyond, para p, highest refuge, parayana p, safety, tana p, 
security, kima p, happiness, siva p, unique, kivala p, abodeless, analaya p, imprishable, akara p, absolute purity, visuddho p, sipramandane, lakutara p, immortality amata p, emancipation, mud e p, peace, santi p, etc. Nirvana has the following general characteristics. Permanent, tranquil, extinguish, no aging, no death, purity, liberated from existence, passiveness, without effort, no rebirth, calm joy, transmigration to extinction, extinction or end of all return to reincarnation, cessation of rebirth, extinction of passion, and extinction of all misery and entry into bliss. You should always remember that when you are still reborn in the samsara, you still have to prepare for a long journey from here, samsara, to nirvana. It is important to cultivate on a regular basis so you can obtain wisdom that is necessary for your journey. Do not seek the transcendental events or supernatural powers of just one existence. Look to the end of the journey. Nirvana. The word nirvana literally means extinguished and therefore tranquil. A question is raised whether nirvana is only a transformed state of mind or whether it is another dimension of being. The word has been used both for a transformed psychological state and for a metaphysical status. Buddhist literature is full of statements which go to show that nirvana is a transformed state of personality and consciousness. The transformation is described in negative terms as a destruction of craving and detachments, and in positive terms, as the emergence of transcendental wisdom and peace. According to Buddhist philosophy, there are four ways of description of a nirvana. The first way of description of nirvana is negative. The negative description is the most common. Nirvana is deathless, unchanging, imperishable, without end, non-production, extinction of birth unborn, not liable to dissolution, uncreated, free from disease, unaging, freedom from transmigration, utmost, cessation of pain, and final release. The second way of description of nirvana is positive. Nirvana is peace, bliss, transcendental wisdom, pure insecurity. Impermanent, indeed, are all conditioned things. It is their very nature to come into being and then to cease. Having been produced, they are stopped. Their cessation brings peace and ease. Cessation also means extinction of craving and cessation of suffering with a state of calm. In a positive way, nirvana also means the supreme bliss, transcendental wisdom, illumination, and pure radiant consciousness. The third way of description of nirvana is paradoxical. This statement is mostly found in Pratyaparamita or Madhyamaka literature. Nirvana is abiding in a state of non-abiding. The only way of reaching the goal is to realize that in the ultimate sense, there is no goal to be reached. Nirvana is reality which is void, sunya. The fourth way of description of nirvana is symbolical. Symbolical description differs from the paradoxical in avoiding to speak in abstractions and using concrete images instead. From this standpoint, Nirvana is the cool cave, the island in the flood, the further shore, the holy city, the refuge, the shelter, and the safe asylum. According to Buddhism, Nirvana has many characteristics. First, Nirvana may be enjoyed in the present life as an attainable state. Second, Nirvana has four virtues or transcendental characteristics in Buddhism, or four noble qualities of the Buddha's life expounded in the Nirvana Sutra eternity, or permanence, permanence versus impermanence, joy, or happiness, bliss versus suffering or the paramita of joy, personality or soul or true self, supreme self versus personal ego, purity, equanimity versus anxiety. Besides, nirvana also has many other special characteristics. First, an attainable state in this life by right aspiration, purity of life, and the elimination of egoism. The Buddha speaks of nirvana as unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, and unformed contrasting with the born, originated, created and formed phenomenal world. Second, the fact that nirvana is realized as one of the mental states. It is not a state of nothingness. Third, nirvana is not a place or a kind of heaven where a self or soul resides. Nirvana is the attainment of a state which is dependent on this body itself, 
and this state can be achieved in this very life. Nirvana is beyond description of words. It is beyond time and space described by ordinary people. Fourth, Nirvana is a place where, if we can temporarily say so, craving, hate and delusion are destroyed. Nirvana is the attainment of the cessation of sufferings. However, there are some heretic opinions in Nirvana. Nirvana is permanent and eternal, however, heretics believe that everything including Nirvana is impermanent. Nirvana is a real Buddha nature, however, heretics believe that there is no such Buddha nature. Nirvana is a permanent place of bliss, however, heretics believe that everywhere including Nirvana is no pleasure, but suffering. This is one of the eight upside-down views which belongs to the four upside-down views on impermanence. Buddhism believes that nirvana is permanent and eternal, however, heretics believe that everything including nirvana is impermanent. Nirvana is pure, however, heretics believe that everything is impure. This is one of the eight upside-down views which belongs to the four upside-down views on impermanence. Buddhism believes that nirvana is permanent and eternal, However, heretics believe that everything including nirvana is impermanent. At the time of the Buddha, there existed some problems concerning nirvana. Some are born in a womb, evildoers are reborn in hells, the righteous people go to blissful states, the undefiled ones pass away into nirvana, Dharmapada 126. In the Dharmapada Sutra, whenever the Buddha was asked by a questioner whether he was to live after death or what sort of world he was to enter after nirvana, he always remained silent. When the when the Buddha remained silent to a question requiring an answer of yes or no his silence usually meant assent. But his silence on the question concerning nirvana was due to the fact that his listeners could not understand the profound philosophy involved. The main problem of Buddhism either formalistic or idealistic was concerning the extinction of human passion because this distorted state of mind is considered to be the source of all evils of human life. Human passion can be extinguished even during one's lifetime. Therefore liberation from such disorder of mind is the chief object of Buddhist culture. Nirvana means the extinction of passion, of desire, of sense, of mind, and even of individual consciousness. To Buddhist mind, nirvana did not contain any idea of deification of the Buddha. It simply meant the eternal continuation of his personality in the highest sense of the word. It meant returning to his original state of Buddha nature, which is his Dharma body, but not his scripture body as misunderstood by people. Dharma means the ideal itself which the Buddha conceived in his perfect enlightenment. Nirvana is this ideal body which is without any restricting conditions. The formalists, on the other hand, hold that the scripture is the perfect representation of the ideal of the Buddha. Hence their opinion that the Buddha lives forever in the scripture body, nirvana being his entire annihilation and extinction otherwise. The principle of nirvana or the state of a fire blown out in the light of space and time. It was an illusion on the part of philosophers, especially some of the Indian philosophers, to believe that space and time were infinite. Buddhism, however, has never treated space and time as infinite, for Buddhism takes them to be physical matters. The theory that space is curved, set forth by modern physicists, has considerably facilitated the elucidation of the doctrine of nirvana. The universe, or the realm of principle, dharmadhatu, as it is technically called, is the region which is occupied by space and time, and in which they control all the waves of existence. So in practice, the space-time world is the ocean of the waves of life and death. It is the sphere of the flowing cycles of life or samsara, the world of creation, of energy, of action, of causation and ideation, of self-creation and of dynamic becoming. It is the sphere of desire, matter, form, and mind. Space is considered one of the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space, and it is sometimes represented to be of round shape. Time is treated as real in some schools, while in other schools it is treated as unreal. But it is to be particularly noted that time has never been considered to exist separately from space. That is to say, every being or thing has time of its own. Space and time are always correlative. Men have an average lifetime of 100 years. 
but a crane is said to live for a thousand years, and a tortoise even ten thousand years. And with the heavenly beings, their one day and night is said to be as long as the whole fifty years of the earthly men. A day fly, on the other hand, live a short wavelength of only one day. 368. Heaven is not a nirvana. According to dictionary, heaven means the dwelling place of the deity. However, for a Buddhist, both heaven and hell are right here, right in this world. That is to say you can create your own heaven or hell right here in this world. It's ridiculous to create all kinds of unwholesome deeds, then simply with faith or praying you can create a heaven. Buddhist belief in heaven is simple, if you live and act according to moral principles, you can create your own heaven right here in this world. If not, you can also create the hell on this earth itself. Sincere Buddhists never expect a heaven elsewhere to reward a virtue, or a hell to punish vice, virtue and evil have inevitable consequences in this world itself. These consequences can be considered as heaven or hell at the very moment. Buddhist literature contains too many descriptions of realms in which beings are reborn as a consequence of their past performance. According to Abhidharmakosa, there are six heavens in the desire realm and seventeen in the form realm. Sentient beings who are born into these heavens are referred to as gods. Celestial beings or gods are one of the three good modes of existence as a reward for their previous good deeds. Divas allotted a very long, happy life in the Diva, although they are still subject to the cycle of rebirth. However, this happiness may constitute a substantial hindrance on their path to liberation, for they cannot recognize the truth of suffering. So heaven is seen as undesirable in Buddhism because gods inevitably exhaust their good karma and are reborn in one of the lower realms of existence, where they again become subject to suffering. Thus the final goal of any Buddhists should be a liberation of all kinds of existence in the cycle of rebirth. 369. The Buddha's Nirvana. At the age of 80, the Buddha accompanied by a large assembly of monks, made a long journey from the vulture peak near Rahagaha to many towns, cities, and villages, where he preached the Dharma enlightening his disciples with various discourses and emphasizing the fundamental doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. He said, It is through not comprehending the Four Noble Truths, you and I have had to wander so long in the six miserable paths with rebirth after rebirth. He also emphasized on the threefold training of right conduct, concentration and wisdom. When they arrived at Basali, a Prasperia city, they stayed at Ambapali's mango grove, where the Buddha gave a lecture to the Likavis and Ambapali, who later offered the Buddha and his sang at her mango grove. In his last retreat in Baluva, a village near Visali. Here he felt sharp pains, but he bore them without any complaint. Soon after his recovery, in his last instruction to the order, he addressed the venerable Ananda. The Tathagata does not think that he should lead the order, nor does the order depend on him. Therefore, Ananda, be labs to yourselves. Take no external refuge. Hold fast to the Dharma as a lamp. Hold fast to the Dharma as a refuge. And how, Ananda, is a bhikshu to be a lamp to himself, a refuge to himself, taking no external refuge, holding fast to the Dharma as a lamp. Herein, a bhikshu lives diligent, mindful, and self-possessed, overcoming desire and grief in the world, reflecting on the body, feeling, mind and mental objects. The Buddha emphasized on the importance of personal striving for purification and freedom from suffering. The Buddha and the order arrived at Pava and stayed at Kunda's mango grove, where they were treated by the blacksmith the Buddha's last meal. The Buddha reminded the order that the Buddha's last and first meals were of greater profit than any others. Eventually, they moved on to the Sala grove of the Malas in Kusinara, where a wandering ascetic, Subhata, approached the Buddha and requested him to clear his doubt about other religious teachers at that time. The Buddha spoke. In whatever doctrine and discipline. Subhata, the noble eightfold path is not found, neither is there found the first samana, nor the second, nor the third, nor the fourth. Now in this doctrine and discipline, Subhata, there is the noble eightfold path, and in it too, are found the first, the second, the third, and the fourth samanas. The other teachers' schools are empty of samanas. 
If, subhada, the disciples live rightly, the world would not be void of arahants. Void of true saints are the systems of other teachers. But in this one, may the bhiksas live the perfect life, so that the world would not be without saints. The ascetic subhada became the Buddha's last disciple, and soon after his ordination, he also became an arahant. At last the Buddha addressed the order before his final exhortation. Behold now, Bixus, I exhort you. Subject to change are all component things. Strive on with diligence. Then the Buddha passed away on the full moon of the Vesak month in 543 BC. His body was cremated with great ceremony and the relics were divided among Brahmins, kings, and nobles, and were then enshrined in the eight great stupas. 570. Incomplete and complete nirvanas. The realm of nirvana, the abode of nirvana, or bliss, where all virtues are stored and whence all good comes, one of the three dharmas of inaction. Mahayana Buddhism also agrees with the Pali literature, nirvana is that which is neither discarded nor attained, it is neither a thing destroyed nor a thing eternal, it is neither suppressed nor does it arise. It is the state of final release. However, the Mahayanists gave further explanation on nirvana. Nirvana is the state of the bodhisattva who does not want to retire into the final release, even though he is fully entitled to it, and who by his free choice, devotes himself to the services of all sentient beings. In the Madhyamaka Sastra Karakavrti, Kandra Kurti defined that nirvana is what is not abandoned nor acquire, what is not annihilation nor eternality, what is not destroyed nor created. According to Nagarjuna Bodhisattva in the Madhyamaka philosophy, the absolute is transcendent to both thought and speech. Neither the concept of bhavanata bhava is applicable to it. Nirvana or the absolute reality cannot be a bhava or empirical existence, for in that case, it would be subject to origination, decay, and death, there is no empirical existence which is free from decay and death. If it cannot be bhava or existence, far less can it be a bhava or non-existence, for non-existence is only the concept of absence of existence, a bhava. When bhava itself is proved to be inapplicable to reality. Abhava cannot stand scrutiny, for abhava is known only as the disappearance of bhava. When the concept of bhava or empirical existence and abhava or the negation of bhava cannot be applied to the absolute, the question of applying any other concept to it does not arise, for all other concepts depend upon the above two. In summary, the absolute is transcendent to thought, and because it is transcendent to thought, it is inexpressible. What cannot be an object of thought cannot be an object of speech. According to Keith in the Dictionary of Chinese-English Buddhist Terms, there are two kinds of nirvana. The first kind of nirvana is the incomplete nirvana, Kalisa Parinibbana p. The cause of reincarnation is ended. Nirvana reached by those enlightened beings who have not yet completely rid themselves of their samsaric burden of skandhas. The cause has been annihilated, but the remnant of effect still remains. A saint may enter into this nirvana during life, but has continued to live in this mortal realm, has not yet eliminated the five aggregates, till the death of his body. There are two different views on the incomplete nirvana. Hinayana holds that the arat, with the full extinction of afflictions, after his last term of mortal existence enters into nirvana, while alive here he is in the state of limited or modified nirvana, sapatisisa nirvan in contrasted with complete nirvana, nirpatisisa nirvana. An arat whose taints are destroyed, who has lived the life, done what was to be done, laid down the burden, attained arahatship by stages, destroyed completely the bond of becoming, one who is free through knowing rightly. As his faculties have not been demolished he experiences what is agreeable and disagreeable, he experiences pleasure and pain. The five aggregates remain. It is his extinction of lust, hate and delusion, that is called the Nibbana element with a basis remaining, Sapatasis and Nibbanadhadu. The Mahayana holds that when the cause of reincarnation is ended the state is that of incomplete Nirvana, when the effect is ended, and the eternal Buddha body has been obtained, then there is a complete Nirvana. The Mahayana says that in the Hinayana remainderless Nirvana for the Arat, there are still remains of illusion, karma, and suffering, 
and it is therefore only an incomplete nirvana in Mahayana. In Mahayana, complete nirvana, these remains of illusion, karma, etc., are ended. As a technical term the extinction of human passion is called the nirvana, with the condition of being still remaining or, the nirvana, with the upadhi remnant upadhi being the material and immaterial condition of being. The second kind of nirvana is the nirvana element without a basis remaining. Where there are no more cause and effect, the connection with the chain of mortal life being ended. A saint enters this perfect nirvana upon the death of his body, the aggregates have been eliminated. This is the final nirvana without remainder of reincarnation where all the effects kwau, are ended. The nirvana state in which exists no remainder of the karma of suffering, or the full extinction of the groups of existence. Final nirvana without remainder of reincarnation where all the effects kwau, are ended. The nirvana state in which exists no remainder of the karma of suffering, or the full extinction of the groups of existence. The nirvana of erat extinction of body and mind. An erat whose taints are destroyed, who has lived life, done what was to be done laid down the burden, attained arahitship by stages, destroyed completely the bond of becoming, one who is free through knowing rightly. All his feelings not being welcome, not being delighted in, will here and now become cool, it is thus, that is called the nibbana element without a basis remaining. Static nirvana, the nirvana after death, the remainderless extinction of liberated one, in which all relationship to the world is broken off and there is no activity. It opposed to a pratisdita nirvana, in which the liberated one choose to remain in the world where bodhisattvas renounce entry into pratisdita nirvana, so that he can, in accordance with his vow, lead beings on the way to liberation. The nirvana without the upadhi remnant. It is the total extinction of the conditions of being as well as of passion. One may call it the annihilation of being. This is nirvana of perfect freedom, or the passing away of Sakyamuni Buddha. Besides, according to the Surangama Sutra, Book 9, in the section of the Ten States of Formation Skanda, the Buddha reminded Ananda about the five kinds of immediate nirvana. Further, in his practice of samadhi, the good person's mind is firm, unmoving, and proper, and can no longer be disturbed by demons. He can thoroughly investigate the origin of all categories of beings and contemplate the source of the subtle fleeting and constant fluctuation. But if he begins to speculate on existence after death, he could fall into error with five theories of nirvana. Because of these speculations about five kinds of immediate nirvana, he will fall into externalism and become confused about the body nature. First, he may consider the heavens of the desire realm a true refuge because he contemplates their extensive brightness and longs for it. Second, he may take refuge in the first dhyana because there his nature is free from worry. Third, he may take refuge in the second dhyana because there his mind is free from suffering. Fourth, he may take refuge in the third dhyana because he delights in its extreme joy. Fifth, he may take refuge in the fourth dhyana reasoning that suffering and bliss are both ended there, and that he will no longer undergo transmigration. These heavens are subject to outflows, but in his confusion he thinks that they are unconditioned, and he takes these five states of tranquility to be refuge of supreme purity. Considering back and forth in this way, he decides that these five states are ultimate. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are five kinds of anagamans, naham, who never return to the desire real. First, the less than half timer, where the anagaman who enters on the intermediate stage between the realm of desire and the higher realm of form. Second, the more than half timer, where the anagaman who is born into the form world and soon overcome the remains of illusions. Third, the gainer with exertion, where the anagaman who diligently works his way through the final stage. Fourth, the gainer without exertion, where the anagaman whose final departure is delayed through lack of aid and slackness. Fifth, nirvana where he who goes upstream to the highest. The anagaman who proceeds from lower to higher heavens into nirvana. 371. Eight things that led to the cutting off of affairs. According to the Padaliya Sutta in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, there are eight things in the Noble One's discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. 
First, with the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Here a noble disciple considers thus. I am practicing the way to abandoning and cutting off of those fetters, because of which I might kill living beings. If I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so, the wise, having investigated, would censure me for doing so, and on the dissolution of the body, after death, because of killing living beings an unhappy destination would be expected. But this killing of living beings is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while taints, vexation, and fever might arise through the killing of living beings, there are no taints, vexation, and fever in one who abstains from killing living beings. So it is with reference to this that it was said. With the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. Second, with the support of taking only what is given, the taking of what is not given is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Third, with the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Fourth, with the support on malicious speech, malicious speech is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Fifth, with the support of refraining from rapacious greed, rapacious greed is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Sixth, with the support of refraining from spiteful scolding, spiteful scolding, is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Seventh, with the support of refraining from angry despair, angry despair is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. Eighth, with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. The rest remains the same as above. 372. Four Courses of Attainment of Buddhahood. According to the Mahavastu, there are four courses of attainment of Buddhahood. The first course is the Prakritikarya. In this Karya, an individual is expected to be obedient to his parents, to the Sramanas and Brahmins, and to the elders, to perform good deeds, to instruct others to offer gifts, and to worship the Buddhas. While a being is in this Karya, he is just a common being and not a Bodhisattva. Sakyamuni Buddha practiced this karya from the time of a Parajitad Vajra Buddha. The second course is the Praniti. This consists in a being's resolving to attain Bodhi in due course. Sakyamuni took this resolution five times in the course of his many existences as the ancient Sakyamuni Buddha, whose life extended over eons. The third course is the Anuloma. It is a continuation of the previous karya and consists in acquiring the virtues necessary to become a Buddha. Sakyamuni began this karya at the time of Samatavi Buddha. During the second and third karyas, a bodhisattva acquires the virtues mentioned in the Jatakas, and advances from the first to the eighth bhumi. Sakyamuni reached the seventh bhumi, when he was born as Prince Kusa. The fourth course is the Avavarta or Anivartana. This is called a non-returning karya, it commences with the Bodhisattva reaching the eighth Bhumi when retrogression becomes impossible for him. When Sakyamuni was reborn as Megamanava, he reached this Karya the time of Dipankara Buddha, who confirmed his ultimate success in attaining Bodhi. It was reconfirmed by Sarvabhibhu Buddha when Sakyamuni was born as Abhiya or Abhiji Bhikshu. Subsequently, the Bodhisattva was born innumerable times in order to cross the eighth and ninth Bhumis. He ultimately reached the tenth Bhumi to be born as Jayatipalamanava and given Uvarajyabhisika by Kasyapa Buddha, at last becoming the god of gods in the Tusita heaven. He was to complete the tenth Bhumi as Gautama Buddha under the Bodhi tree at Gaya. 373. Eight Awakenings of Great People. The form of the sutra is very simple. The text form is ancient, just like the 42 chapters and the sutra on the six paramitas. However, its content is extremely profound and marvelous. Shramana and Shai Kao, a Parshan monk, translated from Sanskrit into Chinese in about 150 AD, during the later Han Dynasty. Most Venerable Thich Than Tu, translated from Chinese into Vietnamese in the 1970s. The original text of this sutra in Sanskrit is still extant to this day. This sutra is entirely in accord with both the Theravada and Mahayana traditions. 
In fact, each of the eight items in this sutra can be considered as a subject of meditation which Buddhist disciples should at all times, by day and by night, with a sincere attitude, recite and keep in mind eight truths that all great people awaken to. These are eight truths that all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and great people awaken to. After awakening, they then energetically cultivate the way. By steeping themselves in kindness and compassion, they grow wisdom. They sail the Dharma body ship all the way across to Nirvana's other shore, only to re-enter the sea of death and rebirth to rescue all living beings. They use these eight truths to point out the right road to all beings, and in this way, help them to recognize the anguish of death and rebirth. They inspire all to cast off and forsake the five desires, and instead to cultivate their minds in the way of all sages. If Buddhist disciples recite this sutra on the eight awakenings and constantly ponder its meaning, they will certainly eradicate boundless offenses, advance toward body, quickly realize proper enlightenment, forever be free of death and rebirth, and eternally abide in joy. Every one of us knows what we deeply aspire to gain is happiness, and what we try to avoid is sufferings and afflictions, however, our actions and behaviors in daily life do not bring us any joy and happiness, on the contrary, they only lead us to more sufferings and afflictions. Why? Buddhism believes that we cause our own sufferings and afflictions because we are not awakening of the truth. Buddhism claims that experiences which are apparently pleasurable in this world are ultimately states of suffering. Devout Buddhists should see clearly the point is that we perceive them as states of pleasure only because, in comparison to states of sufferings and afflictions, they appear as a form of relief. A disciple of the Buddha, day and night, should wholeheartedly recite and meditate on the eight awakenings discovered by the great beings. The first awakening is the awareness that the world is impermanent. All regimes are subject to fall, all things composed of the four elements that are empty and contain the seeds of suffering. Human beings are composed of five aggregates and are without a separate self. They are always in the process of change, constantly being born and constantly dying. They are empty of self, without sovereignty. The mind is the source of all unwholesome deeds and confusion and the body is the forest of all impure actions. If we meditate on these facts, we can gradually be released from the cycle of birth and death. The world is impermanent, countries are perilous and fragile, the body's four elements are a source of pain, ultimately, they are empty, the five aggregates, skandhas, are not me, death and rebirth are simply a series of transformations, misleading, unreal, and uncontrollable, the mind is the wellspring of evil, the body is the breeding ground of offenses. Whoever can investigate and contemplate these truths will gradually break free of death and rebirth. The second awakening is the awareness that more desire brings more suffering. The awareness that more desire brings more suffering. All hardships in daily life arise from greed and desire. Those with little desire and ambition are able to relax, their bodies and minds are free from entanglement. Too much desire brings pain. Death and rebirth are tiresome ordeals which stem from our thoughts of greed and desire. By reducing desires, we can realize absolute truth and enjoy independence and well-being in both body and mind. The third awakening is the awareness that the human mind is always searching for possessions and never feels fulfilled. This causes impure actions to ever increase. In our daily life we always want to have good food, nice clothes, attractive jewelry, but we only feel satisfied with them for a short time, after that, the very same object that once gave us pleasure, might cause us frustration now. The same can also be applied to fame. At the beginning we might think ourselves that we are so happy when we are famous, but after some time, it could be that all we feel is frustration and dissatisfaction. Bodhisattvas, however, always remember the principle of having few desires. They live a simple life in peace in order to practice the way and consider the realization of perfect undestending as their only career. Our minds are never satisfied or content with just enough. The more we obtain, the more we want, thus we create offenses and do evil deeds. Bodhisattvas do not make mistakes, instead, they are always content, nurture the way by living a quiet life in humble surroundings. 
their sole occupation is cultivating wisdom. The fourth awakening is the awareness of the extent to which laziness is an obstacle to practice. For this reason, we must practice diligently to destroy the unwholesome mental factors which bind us and to conquer the four kinds of Mara in order to free ourselves from the prison of the five aggregates and the three worlds. Idleness and self-indulgence will be our downfall. With unflagging vigor, great people break through their afflictions in baseness. They vanquish and humble the four kinds of demons, and they escape from the prison of the five skandhas. The fifth awakening is the awareness that ignorance is the cause of the endless cycle of birth and death. Therefore, bodhisattvas always listen and learn in order to develop their understanding and eloquence. This enables them to educate living beings and bring them to the realm of great joy. Stupidity and ignorance are the cause of death and rebirth. Bodhisattvas are always attentive to and appreciative of extensive study and erudition. They strive to expand their wisdom and refine their eloquence. Teaching and transforming living beings, nothing brings them greater joy than this. The sixth awakening is the awareness that poverty creates hatred and anger, which creates a vicious cycle of negative thoughts and activity. When practicing generosity, bodhiattvas consider everyone, friends and enemies alike, as equal. They do not condemn anyone's past wrongdoings, nor do they hate those who are presently causing harm. The suffering of poverty breeds deep resentment, wealth unfairly distributed creates ill will and conflict among people. So, bodhisattvas practice giving and treat friend and foe alike. They neither harbor grudges nor despite evil-natured popal. The seventh awakening is the awareness that the five categories of desire lead to difficulties. Although we are in the world, we should try not to be caught up in worldly matters. A monk, for example, has in his possession only three robes and one bowl. He lives simply in order to practice the way. His precepts keep him free of attachment to worldly things, and he treats everyone equally and with compassion. Great people, even as laity, are not blithely by worldly pleasures, instead, they constantly aspire to take up the three precepts robes and blessing bowl of the monastic life. Their ideal and ambition is to leave the household and family life to cultivate the way in immaculate purity. Their virtuous qualities are lofty and sublime, their attitudes toward all creatures are kind and compassionate. The eighth awakening is the awareness that the fire of birth and death is raging, causing endless suffering everywhere. Bodhisattvas should take the great vow to help everyone, to suffer with everyone, and to guide all beings to the realm of great joy. Rebirth and death are beset with measureless suffering and afflictions, like a blazing fire. Thus, great people make the resolve to cultivate the great vehicle to rescue all beings. They endure endless hardship while standing in for others. They lead everyone to ultimate happiness. 374. Ordinary people praise Tathagata for elementary matters. According to the Brahmahala Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, ordinary people would praise the Tathagata for elementary inferior matters of moral practice. First, abandoning the taking of life, the ascetic Gautama dwells refraining from taking life. Second, without stick or sword, scrupulous, compassionate, trembling for the welfare of all living beings. Third, abandoning from taking what is not given, the ascetic Gautama dwells refraining from taking what is not given, living purely, accepting what is given, awaiting what is given, without stealing. Fourth, abandoning unchastity, the ascetic Gautama lives far from it, aloof from the village practice of sex. Fifth, abandoning false speech, the ascetic Gautama dwells refraining from false speech, a truth speaker, one to be relied on, trustworthy, dependable, not a deceiver of the world. Sixth, abandoning malicious speech, he does not repeat there what he has heard here to the detriment of these, or repeat what he has heard there to the detriment of those. Thus he is a reconciler of those at variance, and an encourager of those at one, rejoicing in peace, loving it, delighting in it, one who speaks up for peace. Seventh, abandoning harsh speech, he refrains from it. He speaks whatever is blameless, pleasing to the ear, agreeable, reaching the heart, urbane, pleasing and attractive to the multitude. Eighth, abandoning idle chatter, he speaks at the right time, what is correct and to the point, of dhamma and discipline. 
he is a speaker whose words are to be treasured, seasonable, reasoned, well-defined and connected with the goal. Ninth, the ascetic Gautama is a refrainer from damaging seeds and crops. He eats once a day and not at night, refraining from eating at improper times. Tenth, the ascetic Gautama avoids watching dancing, singing, music and shows. Eleventh, the ascetic Gautama abstains from using garlands, perfumes, cosmetics, ornaments and adornments. Twelfth, the ascetic Gautama avoids using high or wide beds. Thirteenth, the ascetic Gautama avoids accepting gold and silver. Fourteenth, the ascetic Gautama avoids accepting raw grain. Fifteenth, the ascetic Gautama avoids accepting raw flesh. Sixteenth, the ascetic Gautama does not accept women and young girls. Seventeenth, the ascetic Gautama does not accept male or female slaves. Eighteenth, the ascetic Gautama does not accept sheep and goats, cocks and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares. Nineteenth, the ascetic Gautama does not accept fields and plots. Twentieth, the ascetic Gautama refrains from running errands. Twenty-first, the ascetic Gautama refrains from buying and selling. Twenty-second, the ascetic Gautama refrains from cheating with false weights and measures. Twenty-third, the ascetic Gautama refrains from bribery and corruption, deception and insincerity. Twenty-fourth, the ascetic Gautama refrains from wounding, killing, imprisoning, highway robbery, and taking food by force. 375. Ordinary people often praise the Tathagata for these average matters. According to the Brahmahala Sutta and the long discourses of the Buddha, ordinary people often praise the Tathagata for these average matters. Whereas, some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the faithful, are addicted to the destruction of such seeds as are propagated from roots, from stems, from joints, from cuttings, from seeds, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such destruction. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the faithful, remain addicted to the enjoyment of stored up goods such as food, drink, clothing, carriage, beds, perfumes, meat, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such enjoyment. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to attending such shows as dancing, singing, music, displays, recitations, hand music, cymbals and drums, fairy shows, acrobatic and conjuring tricks, combats of elephants, buffaloes, bulls, goats, rams, cocks and quail, fighting with staves, boxing, wrestling, sham fights, parades, maneuvers and military reviews. The ascetic Gautama refrains from such displays. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to such games and idle pursuits as eight or ten row chess, chess in the air, hopscotch, spillikins, dicing, hitting sticks, hand pictures, ball games, blowing through toy pipes, playing with toy plows, turning somersaults, playing with toy windmills, measures, carriages and bows, guessing letters, guessing thoughts, mimicking deformities, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such idle pursuit. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to high and wide beds and long chairs, couches adorned with animal figures, fleecy or variegated coverlets, coverlets with hair on both sides or one side, silk coverlets, embroidered with gems or without, elephant rugs, horse rugs, or chariot rugs, choice spreads of antelope hide, couches with awnings, or with red cushions at both ends. The ascetics Gautama refrains from such high and wide beds. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to such forms of self-adornment and embellishment as rubbing the body with perfumes, massaging, bathing in scented water, shampooing, using mirrors, ointments, garlands, scents, unguents, cosmetics, bracelets, headbands, fancy sticks, bottles, swords, sunshades, decorated sandals, turbans, gems, yak tail fans, long fringed white robes, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such self-adornment. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to such unedifying conversation as about kings, robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, wars, food, drink, clothes, beds, garlands, perfumes, relatives, carriages, villages, towns, and cities, countries, women, heroes, street gossip and well gossip.
talk of the departed desultory chat, speculations about land and sea, talk about being and non-being, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such conversation. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to disputation such as. You don't understand this doctrine and discipline I do. How could you understand this doctrine and discipline? Your way is all wrong mine is right. I am consistent, you aren't. You said last what you have said first, and you said first what you should have said last. What you took so long to think up has been refuted. Your argument has been overthrown, you're defeated. Go on, save your doctrine get out of that if you can. The ascetic Gautama refrains from such disputation. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to such things as running errands and messages, such as for kings, ministers, nobles, Brahmins, householders and young men who say. Go here go there. Take this there bring that from there. The ascetic Gautama refrains from such errand running. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins remain addicted to deception, patter, hinting, belittling, and are always on the make for further gains, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such deception. This is the end of this video. Dear fellow Buddhist, just as the Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. By subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way. By subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.